Good evening, the folks from China DevOps Days community. Today, we have two very special guests from the Agile and DevOps world. Let's welcome Patrick DeBois, one of the most influential person in DevOps community, the founder of Global DevOps Days Movement. And let's also welcome Ari van Benekom, the co-author of Agile Manifesto, chief examiner of Exxon Agile program. I am Sun Jin Peng, the co-organizer of China DevOps Days. It is my great privilege to host the interview with these two industry thought leaders. Both of them have visited China DevOps Days event in past years. This year, due to COVID-19 pandemic, international travel become extremely challenging. Tonight, we are very grateful to have their support remotely. I would like to start with Patrick to share some of his experience at China DevOps Days kickoff event back to Beijing 2017. Hi, Patrick. At our first China visit was very short. We have promised each other to have you back again. Would you please share of your first impressions of China and our China DevOps Days event? Well, thank you, Son. Um, and I appreciate, I want to give you a big shout out and thank you for uh, hosting and, and kind of making this happen. Uh, I'm, it's too bad I can't make it in person. Like you say, I, I'd rather come back in person whenever I, I can. Uh, I think when you when I landed, my first impression of China was you, right? So you were very like nice to me uh, and friendly. Um, and I think what I was like probably many foreigners impressed by the uh, the 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 bigness or like the 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 scale when you land into one of the cities. Um, also, that I'm not like capable of speaking the language, even though I speak a lot of languages. Um, but when I reached the conference and, and talked to many people at the conference, uh, it, it struck me how much effort they went through. They had like a, a translator, especially for me. Uh, they led me to the stage. I experienced for the first time a bodyguard, which was new to me. Uh, but I, I think it's it's like the energy and and the feel that everybody was interested to learn um, about uh, the new things and how things have been progressing. And it was like a, a very big surprise to be on stage, uh, being in that big room uh, where everybody was watching uh, with full energy and engaging. I felt I couldn't engage that much because of the language, but um, I felt the warmth of the whole crowd uh, coming at me uh, on that magical moment uh, when I did my uh, keynote over there, so. Great, great. Um, all right. And Ari, uh, you, I think you've been to China several times, but last year, December, also in Shanghai, I think that was your yeah. first uh, DevOps based experience in uh, China, in Shanghai. Yeah. Can you please also share your experience with your uh, trip uh, in China and Shanghai last year? Yeah, well, <laughs> um, that was my first time in Shanghai, by the way. And I've been to Tianjin in Beijing. Uh, and if you take it a little bit further into the past, you know, uh, coming to China, I have to share with Patrick is you you, you lack the, the the language skill. I don't speak any Chinese, right? So I'm, I'm, I have to say it's almost on the level of arrogant because, you know, you used to go somewhere and people speak at least, you know, English or German or French, and I can somehow manage always. Uh, but then I see the openness of the people, right? When they when they are really uh, the, the, the curious and they want to know. And you talk before or after master classes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and they come, and where the language might be different, and the food is not always you know what I am used to. But I love it, by the way. Um, you you can see when Patrick talks about the energy, you know the similarities where people want to know and and the curiosity uh, that people have. I love that so much and it's amazing. And I love that also being in Shanghai at the DevOps Days, which is of course one of the bigger conferences you have, but also when I do smaller sessions in, in like Tianjin or in, in Beijing, I like that kind of energy. And uh, as you know, last year in Shanghai, we had a really good time. It was really a great, uh, a great moment. And I thank you for that because you got me there. We work sort of, you know, for the same employer. Maybe nobody knows, but we work sort of for the same employer a little bit. You know, I'm, I'm sort of involved in Exxon as well a little bit. Uh, so we got to know each other via that one. But it's a, it's a joy working in China. I love it. Right. Thanks, uh, Ari. Also, thank 
Patrick, yeah. you want to yeah, say Yeah, maybe that? one thing to, that I, uh, I want to add is that like when I yeah. saw everybody on stage and I saw like the presentations later and some of them were in English, I realized that doing this event is important because it, it like brings an other pool of stories, you know, from the the ones that you we've used to, uh, like other companies. Um, and um, I think that was really nice how it started as a connection between uh, the different countries and exchanging uh, kind of like uh, knowledge and, and partnership. So that kind of breaking the silos, uh, you did yeah. that as well across the kind of the, the continents. And that was really nice uh, as a, as a takeaway for me that uh, there's so many talent across the world uh, that has different stories, uh, give different problems uh, that we, we should uh, listen to. So. Right, right. Uh, once again, thanks for both of you uh, supporting uh, our Devil Days event. And Patrick, especially uh, you, I remember your trip was uh, so, you know, it's so special. And we made, uh, you came over within 48 hours and you don't even have a visa with a 78, 72 hours transition visa, but you managed to uh, save uh, the events actually. So uh, a lot of people have been there and still remember that. Um, all right. Uh, I think also since uh, Agile has been, uh, Agile Manifesto has been uh, released back 2001, and DevOps has been uh, released uh, 10, well, 11 years ago, since uh, 2009 in, in Ghent. And finally, uh, with the opportunity of DevOps Days, uh, our Chinese folks and our Chinese community finally had the opportunity to see both of you on stage in person. And if there's no COVID this year, most likely uh, they will have opportunity to see you again in Shanghai. Uh, my next question is regarding uh, the involvement of the two practices and Agile and DevOps. And probably I will first start uh, this time with uh, Ari. Ari, um, since 20 years ago, uh, Agile Manifesto has been uh, announced with the 17 uh, authors in South Lake, uh, in the United States. And have you imagined how Agile and Patrick DevOps uh, has been impact the business world today back then, let's say 20 years ago and 10 years ago? And that's the first part of the question. <laughs> and the second part of the question is that, how do you see uh, Agile and DevOps has been evolved today? And what would you like to see more on the involvement in the future and the trends of those two practices? And maybe uh, Ari, can you start with you first? Yes. Yeah, um, you know, when you, did we imagine the impact when we wrote the manifesto? No. I mean, I can only speak for myself, right? Uh, uh, but it has exploded. Uh, so, you know, a little bit about uh, 2019 and my travel habits in 2019. I had months when I slept two nights in my own bed and the rest I was either on a plane or somewhere else on the globe. Uh, I did never expect that one. On the other side, it's logical, you know, the pace of innovation, you know, the technology has gone up and has taken such an important role, even compared to 2001, when the internet was just this big, right? Uh, right. The impact of technology on, on our uh, life has increased enormously. So right. the fact that we are today, you know, we didn't know in 2001, but you could see it coming in 2010. We had 29 when the biggest telco in the Netherlands was almost blown out of the market by WhatsApp. So this is a 12,000 people company blown out of the market by a 50 people company or maybe even less at the time, right? So you can see that the impact of technology is not only changing business models, it's disrupting business models, making some business models completely obsolete. And you know that the only way is, you know, short cycles, responsive uh, a, a capability as an organization, a corporate capability to respond to change. Today's, today it's survival, right? It's, it's not even a question, do you have to be agile or not? It's, it's if you don't, you die as an organization. And for the future, because I got this morning the question as well, I was in an interview and I think there are two things going on because this, there's almost 20 years of Agile Manifesto, but most organizations still don't have the basics. I'm sorry to say, but they don't have the basics because the, 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 the shifts to make, to go into the, you know, being able to, to have this corporate uh, capability and to respond uh, to change in that way is, uh, that's a lot of bridges to take. 
Um, and, and therefore, I think that what was already going on, you know, what we call business agility, which is for me a no-brainer because you do agile as an organization and nothing else because it's about corporate value that you deliver. But that will be on the market. How can you do it as a whole? And in this, how do you create the perfect place for your people to learn and to develop in this agile environment to become this agile professional, which is seriously different from all those traditional roles, functions, and promotion activities that we have in there. So I think corporate agility, business right. agility will go on for a long time, um, including, uh, you know, adapting the way HR, if you like, you know, adapting the way organizations right. treat their people. Yes, thanks. So basically, Ari, to summarize your answer that you haven't expected when Agile Manifesto has been released 20, year, 20 years ago, the impact to the to the world, yeah. to the business world. And uh, if you'd like to see more of the future is that Agile is no longer only meant for uh, software development, but rather for business agility at larger scales. We will have more questions touch that point later. Uh, thanks for the, for the feedback. And um, Patrick, uh, same question to you. Like 11 years ago, uh, you created the world of DevOps. And have you imagined DevOps will impact the business world today? And what have you seen the evolve have been evolved in the last 10 years? And what do you like to see more the future development of DevOps? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, when I first organized the first uh, DevOps Days event, um, I was looking for interesting ideas and I came across some. And, and for me, that was a way to kind of summarize that. I had no clue that the word DevOps would catch up. It's like somebody wrote a blog post, like, what is this DevOps thing? And it was written after the first event. Um, but I, I think if I look back on many years, I was you know, witnessing the birth of um, Agile or ITIL or any other kind of you know, practices, kind of new way of thinking at that time is that um, you, it's a side guys. It's something in the air. It's something that like a lot of people are like experiencing and can kind of like work towards to or around a certain problem. Uh, so I, I, I never say I invented DevOps. I might have, you know, kind of popularized the word, uh, but the fact that um, I was a big promoter of the ideas and that's something else, right? It's because I believed in that. And, and, and that's something I learned over the, the last 10 years, um, you can read the manifesto uh, uh, and you can do certain practices. When I was thinking in the initial kind of DevOps, I found that a lot of the practices were limited, not by the manifesto or by the thinking, just by the current set of practices and technology enabled things to be like further in operational sites and to move that. So there's definitely an enabler but it's also a pressure point that built up over the years where, you know, a new ID, the same pressure point was where the developers and the business were clashing. Now the devs and the ops were clashing. So it required new practices because the, 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 everything was changing around that. Um, I think with every new ID, there is a tendency. It will not work here. We're special. Uh, I think we're past that now with Agile. We're now past that with DevOps. Uh, like all the bigger enterprises are, you know, willing and taking the word DevOps. Also, everybody doesn't do what it means. So I follow ERA uh, in a way that like you can say you're doing DevOps, but if you're all, that means for you you're doing containers. It, it's not mm -hmm. DevOps, right? Uh, and that's the same thing if you're doing Scrum, then you're doing Agile. So people co sometimes confuse taking on certain practices without the ideas or the spirit or the mindset. Um, and I also found that strangely enough, and I, I don't want to promote uh, like religion or something, but there's a certain um, need for a belief. Do you believe that collaborating will give you better results? Do you believe that sharing the burden, that uh, giving people ownership uh, will give you a better result? If you don't believe that, you probably not agree with our world for you. So we, we kind of have to be conscious for people who don't take that for granted. Uh, and they are 
working in another way. So how this became apparent is that when we moved to dev and ops working together, getting in the same room, and then the cloud came, and then we were collaborating with people outside and everything was abstracted away. So for me personally, that was really strange. Like, are we now, is this the end of DevOps? We just use an API and talk to somebody on the other side. But I learned that you were still need to have a collaboration across company, not even in your own company. And I think that's, for me, the, the interesting part is how that is evolving in the services world, how we... You know, we learned through COVID that remote collaboration doesn't mean that we have to sit in the same building. It's just a matter of a good communication and, and being aligned with the strategy. Um, I think on his side, what I like, I still want to be better at is that the DevOps community actually gets more embedded in the agile community and the other way around. I feel they're still a little bit siloed away. Like, oh yeah, you know, you do that part and we do the other part. And even at conferences, it, I'm not saying they, they don't come up to subjects, but it still feels that we're a little bit siloed. And especially in DevOps, I feel that we, Agile is doing a stronger part on business agility and business focus mm -hmm. and business organization. Where I think in, in practice, not by in spirit, but in practice, a lot of the DevOps transformations are, are kind of more on the technology oriented, kind of pipeline oriented, where they should elevate themselves to a more business level uh, kind of initiative. And, and I hope that's where we're going with the future. Uh, but I also caution that like 10 years is a lot for an ID, and people have formed their ID. Uh, by the crowd, what DevOps is. And for a lot of them, it's config management, containers, and pipeline, where I think it we could go broader, uh, but that's going to be hard uh, to go against kind of that uh, spirit uh, in the future. But then I take peace with the fact that if this is what everybody thinks, somebody will build on top of that to do something else. So I, I have like good spirits uh, in a way that like, we've paved the road for the next thing to arrive or the next wave of thinking or the next bottleneck to be solved, uh, to be worked on that. So that's a little bit how I think about the, the 10 years of uh, growth of uh, DevOps. So. Right. Can I add a little uh, bit on it, so? Sure, sure. Because Please, they triggered me with the word belief <laughs> and religion. Um, the, there's a big thing between uh, you know, doing agile and being agile, and for me, DevOps and, and agile are so connected. Right? It's yin and yang. You can't do one without the other. Um, the 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 big problem is that the, the doing is you're doing some agile rituals in the morning, and we think we're agile, but let's say the belief, and I call it the paradigm shift, because you shift reality. Right? You get a new perception of reality is you do decision-making in another way, collaboration in another way, communication in another way, documentation in another way. And that is very difficult if you have people that the, that have a job that is relying on the old perceptions. And that's the change we have to go through. And that's maybe the most difficult change you can do, a paradigm shift. Right, right. Thanks for writing that, Addy. Um, Patrick, I think I, I do remember three years ago when we did first interview, uh, in Beijing, uh, when I asked you, well, at that time, even today, DevOps kind of hot topics and, and DevOps days is cr across the globe. So I, have to, I remember I asked you, what if one day DevOps no longer the trendy words and left behind? Uh, at that time, your answer was that DevOps also incorporated with other many practices you mentioned like ITO, Agile and others. So you will be still very happy to see DevOps pave the way for the next new practice. I think that's still your answer for today, if I remember what you just tell, share, shared. So yeah, I, and, and, and it's easy for me because I have like no strings attached. I have like no company relying on making money out of it. Uh, so it, I think that's how I've taken peace with like what everybody thinks and what the majority thinks uh, uh, and that it's a good thing, so. Right, and, and you are also very, uh, humble and uh, modest person you always 
trying to deny the fact that DevOps was created by you, but actually you were saying that it was the right time, right moment, it, the right development, and you are just the person um, to speak it out. Um, we are really, uh, in the Chinese culture, we really uh, appreciate that kind of characters and, and also the humble attitude. Uh, I was always impressed by your such attitude. So, but you also mentioned about the, the you know, we are in the Fuka era and there's a lot of things happening um, in, in COVID time. And you just talk about uh, the outbreak of COVID-19. And my next question would be, how do you think that Agile and DevOps practice can contribute a company's business value in such difficult time in the outbreak of COVID-19. Uh, Ari, can I start with you? Uh, well, first of all, I think COVID-19 has shown that that corporate capability to be able to respond to change, what I just referred to, is more essential than ever. Uh, what COVID-19 did was like technology, but then much faster disrupting entire business models uh, companies there are so many companies that lost overnight or let's say over a week or two they lost more than 90 percent of their revenue right so the corporate capability of agile is more needed than ever creativity is all over the place we see it happening at least in my environment you know where entrepreneurs try to do uh, new things um when you come to the, the impact on working, uh, I don't know if it was part of your question, but if you come to the impact of working together, how do we do this? Um, the, the, the remote collaboration that we have is not new. I mean, you know, we can do as if it's new, but it's not. You know, with my team, we work on cross-border international transformations. We have been remoting working for years. Just the difference is now that now is everybody in his own home. And then it was maybe a three different, I had one, uh, one client where we had continuously sessions going on with seven countries, right? I know that's not average, it's a lot, but it happened. Um, and I think what, what, because we were just talking about the change and not, not being open to change and, you know, the paradigm shift. And one of the paradigms is that these kind of things have to happen on site. People always confuse face to face with body to body. We are now face to face. We are not body to body, right? So we have the part of verbal language. We have the non-verbal language. Great. <clears throat> but now we have been pushed the world of education. I mean, for example, the academic work, which is not known as one of the most progressive uh, parts in the world, is really conservative part of the world. Uh, they have been across the globe very, very, very reluctant with uh, remote working and lecturing and classes. And all of a sudden it happens. And now students go to universities for six months for a full semester remote. I do not say remote is as good as, but uh, given the world we live in, uh, what I like about the COVID-19 crisis, it has shown us that we have to treat our world different, that the world is able to recover from what we do to mother world, right? Mother nature and remote working can contribute to this a lot. And of course, face-to-face -face will always be part of who we are as human beings and what we do. But mm -hmm. I was talking to a colleague of mine from, let's say, a competitor, if you like. And he said, Ari, I was sometimes from, from the Netherlands flown into New York for a meeting of one hour. Nobody will talk about this anymore. And we know that it can be done without. So this is where we are today, thanks to technology. All right, so... Uh, COVID-19 has, has brought us a lot if we want to see the light of it. Petr, right. maybe you jump in. Yeah, yeah I think uh, like you, I have been working collaboratively remote for a long time. Like DevOps Days was from the beginning a remote event. Like I, the first event, everybody came internationally. And even though they, they kind of came together uh, at one location, uh, a lot of the conversations have been happening online, you know, on IRC, on chat, on kind of like uh, the Twitters, getting to know the people. So I, I think there's not a per se need to be in the same room. Um, what I like about, like, one thing that struck me about um, COVID uh, is that you can think about it, like uh, the resilience and the chaos engineering it has brought on a business. 
uh, there's this kind of meme on Twitter where you say like, who changed your company, the CEO, kind of your, your project manager and COVID, right? Like in many uh, cases, it brought COVID, but it, it, uh, it highlights the assumption, assume failure, assume kind of things to happen, um, whether that means you're wise, wisely spending your budget, you're not like overspending it, you're not like taking reckless risks, uh, as a company, uh, but the most important part there is there is that um, don't neglect the people that work for you. So I, t I see various reactions in companies, how they react to COVID. Like one is it's really tough. We're doing it really, uh, you know, it's really business is bad. And they're putting the pressure down to the people on the floor. While there's others who kind of understand that people are their most important asset and they, they try to help people through this hard time, maybe give them an extra day of holiday or kind of like help them with understanding or coaching or mental. And, and that shows you also the difference between what the company actually cares about. And it's it's been interesting to observe that, how the different companies react uh, because as much as we like to talk about Agile and DevOps in a business perspective, I, I think there is part of it has, has to be aligned with the individual need and the individual kind of freedom and values they have been bringing. And, and for me, in many cases, this has been shown by COVID or how companies react to COVID uh, through that, so. Right. Um... Thanks, Patrick. I think that you mentioned uh, what I remember three years ago, I was in Silicon Valley. At that time, a lot of uh, internet company, they are so much used to work remotely as virtual team. Uh, but I think COVID-19 has contributed to a lot of traditional kind of companies. They have to work remotely. And also I see there's a lot of uh, like uh, visualization tools facilitating platform like this, what we're having today to facilitate the way it uh, works, but also in kind of collaborating and DevOps in an agile way and, and break the silos as well. So yeah, I think it's good that we mention it uh, in such difficult time. I see a lot of DevOps days uh, this year have been uh, organized remotely uh, as live events as well. Although we are trying still very hard to have the only physical events this year in Shanghai in December. I hope everything will work well uh, for the events in Shanghai. Um, okay, uh, regarding the next questions, uh, we see uh, about a uh, lot of company has been uh, advocate uh, agile and DevOps practices. And sometimes a business are not buying the ideas. Uh, the question is about how can we measure the value of agile and DevOps practices uh, from the business perspective to convince the business there's a necessity or there's a value contribution uh, in adopting those practices. And uh, Patrick, maybe from you this time. Yeah, I, I think that's um, where I see uh, a lot of the DevOps initiatives kind of, uh, let's say fail um, when they keep too much into their technical realm. They, they don't explain the work that they've been doing or the investments they, they, they have done, what that could bring to the business. Um, and, and that means that um, the group of, of uh, people implementing it actually needs to understand the business as well, uh, whether that's in your monitoring or your metric system. Um, it's not like your CPU and your memory. <laughs> it's like how many dollars are, are we like saving or how many dollars are we like uh, uh, winning uh, by having per better performance uh, better deploys in the market? Like, can we be, beat our competitors by, you know, being faster, more agile, more flexible uh, at implementing stuff? And, and that kind of value um, can, can be measured uh, in a way. But you, you can't just measure it by saying, well, if I'm doing one deploy a day, that's better than 10 deploys a day. You know, that, that's a, uh, what I call a vanity metric. It's, it, it says something about your process, but it's not the ultimate goal, right? It's like, how right. much value did you bring uh, and how fast can you bring that value? I also want to counter, but it, it's slightly off your, your tangent of like showing the business value, uh, is that 
a lot of the engineers, they try to over-optimize. And sometimes mm-hmm. the solution is not them adding new servers or them tuning or automating more of the process. So I, I want to highlight the fact that they have to look at it from the global perspective. Sometimes it makes sense to just buy another service or use another service or you know, um, think of another solution where it, <laughs> IT isn't involved or make it simpler uh, in many ways. And, and that is also showing value, not by taking on more, but showing that you're, you're looking at the bigger picture of what you're trying to achieve instead of only thinking about what you can solve is kind of go think of other places that will kind of solve the problem uh, without you doing more work or spending more money on uh, an IT budget. Right, right. So in the end of the day, it is uh, about the business value rather than focused KPIs like the release times and how many times per release meant. Um, okay, uh, Ari, can you add on this uh, in, from uh, yeah. Azure perspective? Yeah, I would like to take it from Patrick with the, one of the last words that he used, like the business value. And uh, excuse my yeah. French, but uh, IT or HR or the legal department or, you know, it's all irrelevant if you don't do it as a corporate, right? This is what you do. And I'm not talking about profit organizations only. Also, when you're a governmental organization, it's okay, what can we do together? And I think, because people very often ask me, oh, what is Agile? Two words, avoiding delay. And that's it. And avoiding delay because we misunderstand each other because we're not talking to the right people or we do remote and written communication. That's one. The other one is delay because we are working inefficient. And man, we are, even when people call themselves Agile, you see all those waterfall principles that are inefficient passing by. And the third one is about the quality and the quality comes up because every one of them, you know, inefficiency is extra time anyway, but the misunderstanding and quality, you know, bugs in the technology are, oh, the both are rework and rework is a delay. And I don't think you have to be afraid to set KPIs. I don't think you have to be afraid to set the KPIs on the IT level, but also on all the other levels. And I think it always comes back to the business. You know, your time to market, the quality that you bring, the, the number of clients that you attract. And I saw, I think it was one of the others, other authors of the Agile Manifesto, I think it was, that if you can measure it, it's not Agile. And I think, what a bullshit. I am not afraid to measure. I am not too afraid to, you know, I was a, a client of mine and now I'm going, getting a little bit into Patrick's uh, area, client of mine said, Ari, you no, know, from you know, the Agile transformation, what do I want to get out of it? I want to get out of the efficiency. I'm a tech company, so I will save time and I will use that time for innovation. It's okay, how can we see the efficiency? What would it mean to you? And one of the things, one of the things that he put on the table, he said, the, re- the lead time of a new requirement in my IT-, IT department is at the moment 18 to 24 months. And I want to bring it down to three months at the max. My release cycle is now three months and I want to bring it down to two weeks. So you can see the combination of the IT KPIs and the business KPIs. And this gentleman was focusing on creating time in his organization for innovation. That was his business KPI. Mm -hmm. And I am not afraid to measure that. I set KPIs with the organization up front on all those things that I just mentioned. And another client of mine was talking about SLA overruns. You know, I have server levels agreement. We miss them all the time. Have to go, that's a business objective. And then you start working in that way to avoid the misunderstandings and to avoid the inefficiency and to avoid all the bugs and problems. And I think this is where technology and business meet. You were talking in the beginning, son, about business and IT. For me, this is such a, I don't understand that because we never talk about business and marketing or business and HR. And all of a sudden we talk about business and IT. And I think, what the hell? We are a company, (laughs) we are one, right? And this is where multidiscipline teams come from. We do it together. Because if I make a beautiful software solution, but I don't get it into the market with the proper marketing, I messed up anyway, right? So that's where you need to go. And I think that's a long way that we have to go. But this is, this is, I think, in terms of KPIs, don't be afraid, measure it. And I, I remember right. a story from uh, somebody uh, talking to a, a C-level person about DevOps in the early days. 
and he was trying to explain how this, you know, collaboration and the pipeline and getting better and uh, kind of like uh, added like value to the business of, you know, being more uh, flexible. And then the, the C-level person just said like, he looked at the costs of, you know, putting everything on there. And then he thought like, but what if I charge every of my customers uh, 50 cents more? <laughs> uh, I will probably have the same winnings <laughs> as you doing so many risky stuff. And I'm, I'm not want to say it's not uh, valuable, but it puts things in perspective, right? Like sometimes the solution is somewhere else and uh, with less risk, with less kind of effort, uh, but you only get those reason truths if you think at a, at a higher level. You cannot do it when you think like, oh, are we saving money by buying machines or humans? No, no. You can only kind of get it when you think of it of a higher level, what your your benefits will be. Uh, I just like remember that like as a nice example to, to illustrate your uh, story area. So. Right, right. But when well, Ari, when you mentioned about uh, what struck me that you said we never talk about business and marketing, but we always say business and IT, why they are separated. Uh, I never thought about it, but I, I'm trying to think of the reasoning behind it. I think in many traditional companies, the CIO, the objectives or the KPF CIO is make their internal business happy people. It's their internal customers. And they were kind of isolated themselves from the business itself rather than supporting their internal clients, which, which is their business people. And if I look about many internet companies, uh, they don't have CIOs. Uh, their IT strategy is their business strategy. Uh, so that's what's automatically aligned. That's why maybe uh, it's easier to measure their uh, value of practice of Azure and DevOps from business perspective. Instead of for many traditional companies, they have difficulty to measure uh, the practices from business side on Azure and DevOps practice because they are sort of disconnected or it's not integrated as many internet companies. So that's how I uh, perceived. Uh, right. So another next question regarding about we all agree that uh, by adopting the red right practice, uh, the efficiency, uh, the business, like uh, Ari says, uh, avoid delays, yeah? Because we are also from lean principles, we are get rid of the uh, waste and remove the bottleneck. And the time is also valuable resource for companies by avoiding delays and all those things. So the question is that, do you believe uh, by adopting the red right practice, 10 time uh, development efficiency and performance are realistic or not? You're asking me, right? Yes, well, I'll start with you, uh, Ari. Okay. Um, uh, I, you know, I, when, when I talk about Agile, it's, it's, I don't, don't do one methodology. I'm focusing on practices only because one team is held by practices from Lean or Kanban, another one from XP or the TDD or, you know, uh, Scrum and DSDM or Crystal or Adaptive. Um, right. So I, I think... Um, that in terms of of practices, we have to focus on. I, I lost your question. Sorry, bring it no, back. Uh, there's well, uh, no problem. What I'm trying to say that there's a lot of uh, practice like Agile and DevOps. Even within Agile, you see DSDM, XP, Scrum. The question is that by adopting the right practice, do you think development efficiency and performance can improve ten times than before they adopting any of these? Uh, practice. Do you think 10 times improvement efficiency are realistic? 10 times, I don't know. Um, I think on the tech side, a lot of companies still have a long way to go. And then we get into Patrick's expertise, right? The, the thing is that we, uh, especially the world in IT, where I'm also originate, uh, we are always busy automating other people's work, but not our own, with all the consequences that are connected to it. So I think there's a lot to go. Then you have the interaction process between all stakeholders when you make something, whatever you make. And all stakeholders is, is the business and is the IT, but it's also the legal and the marketing and all the other. So I think there's so much, to, I don't know about 10, 10 times, but I think a lot of organizations um, uh, can still progress a lot because a lot of organizations are still uh, very much hanging on to old practices 
uh, because we try to get this agile thing going. We try to get the DevOps thing going. And of course, it's growing. Uh, but uh, we have to, uh, I'm looking at Patrick and he has gray hair as well. And I have gray hair too. But I always say, you know, when you go into transformation and change process and, and becoming DevOps and agile as an organization is a change process. The worst people you can meet are guys over 50 years with gray hair and a beard. They are the worst because they don't want to change. And most of the time, those are the people running organizations. So there are so many things still to do. So I don't know about 10 times, son, but seven times, maybe. Yeah. I know. Patrick, what yeah. do you think? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I, I think that uh, that number, maybe uh, the, the 10 times came up with um, the state of DevOps report from Puppet, where they say that like uh, people adopting the new practices uh, there seem to be like 10 times more productive than people not adopting the practices. So I, I think that's where it stems from. But right. um, so the, the survey is a very good thing, but obviously uh, like everything in IT, it, it depends, right? Um, I want to get to the, 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 the crucial part of the question, which is if you define practices as almost like the mechanical thing that somebody does, do you write, do you do your standups every day? Uh, do you have like a deploy script? So more of the mechanical things. Uh, I don't think it is a guarantee that it will work. Um, I, I often meet people um, that, uh, you know, that, that are, let's say, traditionally more ops centric. And um, when I talk to them and they say, well, we're doing all these DevOps things and, uh, and we're, we're automating everything. Uh, okay, so far so good. I'm, I'm happy with what they're saying. But then I hear their narratives change. We're doing this because we think the other people are stupid and we need to protect them against themselves, right? So you're doing the same practice, but you're doing it with a completely different mindset uh, by thinking you need to be the protector of the realm. You need to kind of like hold the fort where a different mentality is that we're going to help them get better. We're going to like reach out. We're going to like educate them. We're going to make it self-servicing. So we be, meet their needs instead of meeting only our needs. And I, I think that shows you the difference in you might be doing the same practice, but you're totally applying it differently with a different mindset on how you deal with these uh, situations. And it, 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 it is, this, uh, I think, uh, in I don't know if anybody remembers, but uh, the bastard operator from hell used to be a meme in the operational world where, you know, you say no, you say no all the time. The same thing is now happening in DevSecOps, right? Where these were the people who said no all the time, like, no, you can't do this, you know, you can't do that. And I think the mentality shift is that they started asking, what do you need to do your job better? And not like, what do we need to do our job better? It's like, what do you need to do your job better? And that is using the same practices, but with a different mindset. And I think that will determine the success of your efficiency in your company way more than per se the practice. You know, the practices you could do as checkboxes. Yes, we're using containers. Yes, we're doing CI. Yes, we're doing tests. Yes, we're doing standouts. But still you might not get the results because your company is not used to collaborating your company is not used to kind of sharing your results your company is still doing not like uh doing blameless postmortems or, or like there's still very much politics involved so i i think the practices are really helpful but you have to be aware that it's not the only thing and that's the scary part is that when people say well, we tried the practices, we did DevOps, it didn't work for us. We, we tried Scrum, it didn't work for us. And, and they kind of the, dismissing the elephant in the room is that their organization didn't change, but right. they just changed their practices. So in that way, I think, like you saying, the result is very much of a variance, whether that's like one or 10 uh, or yep. even negative, uh, because in the beginning, there's often, uh, often a cost at adopting a new practice and it, the whole system goes against it. And if you can't overcome the inertia of the company, you're like stuck with a hole in your hand uh, 
of doing that effort. Um, I don't know if that makes sense to you. And, and uh, you've yeah. probably made it, seen it many times, Era, in the companies adopting it. And then, like you say, not doing, doing the dance, but not in spirit, right? Uh, exactly. Practice. Yeah, maybe so I can I... add a little bit on it. <clears throat> the two things that you need to need to, doing Agile and DevOps is really doing things in a different way. And if you do things in a different way, it means that you have to do things that you never did before. And if you do things that you never did before, they are not going to be perfect because you never did it before. You have to learn to get into this. And managers expect you, you know, it's like, okay, you're world champion in football. Now we are going to uh, play volleyball and I expect you to be a world champion right away, which is bollocks. That doesn't work, right? Mm -hmm. That's one. You, so you need to accept that you have to you know, grow into this. And there's another thing that people underestimate. And I would like to make the metaphor with drive, because I use it this morning with people from Australia. You know, in the Netherlands, we drive on the right side of the road. So right. I said to the people in Australia, you drive on the wrong side of the road, right? Uh, because they drive on the left side of the road. Now, the, I, I made a metaphor like this, and it's really because it happened to me. You can teach me how to drive on the left side of the road. Now, first of all, it looks a lot alike. You know, there's a car, there's a couple of wheels, there's a steering wheel, you know, we have a road, we have other people on the road. It looks all the same, but the rules are different. Rules of engagement are different. And then the worst part is that you can train me to learn those new rules. That's training, right? That's doing, doing agile, doing DevOps. But if something goes wrong, I don't have my set of memories to have the reflexes that help me to within the Agile DevOps concept to find a solution for it. The only thing I have is the old reflex from the past. So you see people going into chains and then in the same time, they go back because yeah. managers say, oh yeah, this is going wrong, this is going wrong. And we implement an old one. And we and before I call it innovating backward. And it happens. <laughs> and those old reflexes are so powerful, you have no idea. And then people will say, oh, yeah, see, it doesn't work for us. No, yep. this is what requires, you know, good help in this transformation, not only to bring the change, but also to sustain the change. Yeah, I fully recognize what you say, and both of you, uh, Patrick and Ari. I remember seven, uh, three years ago uh, when uh, uh, one of the speakers in DevOps Days he was asking me, uh, I was asking him, how do you see people are implementing uh, those practices like DevOps? And he, he says he has seen the companies having uh, a development, have an operation, and they create a, a new department called DevOps department. And they think they are still practice, also practicing DevOps, but then they are looking for the same result as the real DevOps teams. And that's what you say, uh, Patrick and Ari, it's, it's different mindset. And also, it's not only about DevOps, uh, Agile, it's also about the environment, culture, uh, the legacy, the structure, organization structure are fit for it. And, and if the result is not as they expect to see, then they blame the practice didn't work. And they didn't see if they have the right uh, soil, they have the right environment for the practices. And yeah, I, I recognize that. So basically, before we are judging if those can improve the product, product, pro, productivities, uh, it's better to check if you really implement the real uh, essence of Agile and DevOps rather than just learn what people are doing, but without really understanding how other things around it should be set for, for those practices. Right, um, thanks both for the input. Uh, you see, nowadays, are the technologies evolving us uh, so quickly, and we see a lot of emerging technology coming out with cloud, with the big data, AI, blockchain. And how do you see those emerging technologies create a new uh, opportunities or even maybe a challenge for uh, our agile and DevOps practices? And Patrick, maybe start with you. Yeah, I, I think... Um... <clears throat> Once we kind of automate it all we can <laughs> um, in, in, a, in a good way, um, what, what particularly interests me is that um, we're still used to this uh, worldview that we as an IT person control the technology. 
Um, and, uh, and that means uh, we're pretty much directing uh, technology, how to do things, uh, which often reflects our mindset. Uh, but I think this um, interrelationship between your tools and, and the person or the, the tools and, and the process uh, is something that is underestimated. Um, I'm seeing it now in AI ops. I'm seeing it now in DevSecOps um, in a way that We've always been struggling with the concept of trust. Uh, do we trust the tools to help us? Do we trust the tools to do the right thing? Uh, and this kind of interrelationship is some have a, a like 99% that the tools will solve every problem we have as a human. Uh, others take a more assistive approach uh, where technology will help the people um, to do a better job and maybe take care of the standard problems and the known issues and make it surface um, kind of, or help us solve the, the bigger problems. Uh, so th that trend I, I think is, is only starting, whether you see that in your monitoring tools, whether you see that in your deployment tools, uh, your security assessments, is that this assistive use of, of technologies is increasing. Uh, which kind of uh, feeds into the technocratic belief of, you know, everything can be solved by a tool. But uh, I, I am hopeful in a way that it, it gives us uh, a better chance at solving problems at scale, maybe by reducing the noise, helping us kind of filter through issues, uh, dealing with the unknowns, things like observability uh, that we, we kind of, uh, get more context, get more situational awareness uh, when we need to deal with stuff. And whether that's in the operational side or the developer deciding whether he should like change his code, yes or no, depending on the number of errors that are helping uh, happening in production, um, this assistive kind of uh, mentality of technology um, is changing. And um, it'd be interesting to see how this might take the upper hand that we start to believe that the system is always right instead of the humans. Um, yeah. And uh, I realized that sometimes I wonder the CI pipeline or the, the delivery pipeline, um, I think it was John Ospa who made the, the question, imagine you would leave your CI system alone for a day, would it still work? If you leave it alone for a week, will it still work? If you leave it alone for a month, will it still work? And, and the mental exercise is that there will be always people involved in the loop, dealing with the exceptions, dealing with the changes that are happening outside. Uh, and we cannot just blindly rely on the technology to do that. And But it is kind of feeding by automating, automating, automating more. But it's also, again, automate enough to help you up to a level, but don't over automate because of the sake of automation. Uh, always look at like what you're trying to solve. Uh, and that's that's an interesting trend. Uh, like how much can we trust that? How much do we trust the technology uh, to be solving or maybe our organizational problems or, or, or harder problems? Because in a lot of the times people are scared by the automation that it like would automate ourselves out of a job. But I think uh, the, the benefit it brought that we were actually able to tackle more interesting problems or more broader problems with it. And for that to deal with the scale, we probably need the technology again um, to reduce the noise or help us assist, make the right decisions. And that's not only in technology, it will also be on the, the business side, filter through the noise of the, all the data that's coming in and all the monitoring, all the metrics we're, we're tracking. Uh, th that's going to be the the new abstraction layer uh, that we're trying to build uh, on top of everything that we you know like created in abundance <laughs> by our automation is like sifting through the noise is uh, it's going to be a hard part. Right. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, Ari, what is your view on the emerging technologies with uh, agile practices? For me, <clears throat> and and I I always said this. Uh, knowing where I come from, from 1994, when I started doing this, 
Um, if you want to work the way we work and you want to do small cycle deliveries, you know, really go at the end of your sprint or maybe faster into operations or at least be ready for operations, that kind of thing. You have to have your technology. It's impossible to do it by hand because you know you will mess up. You know, this doing by hand will create problems, errors, delays, right? So you cannot do without technology. At the same time, I have an expression that is um, a fool with a tool is still a fool. Um, and exactly. you, you, you have to, to do the right things. Don't over automate as better. It has to have value, uh, but don't restrict yourself. So the experimenting and innovation in there, also in your company, okay, how can we use, you know, new technology or new tools on the market? You know, keep that, that, that curious mind that's looking for information, how to do this. One of the things that I see is that now we, we talked about geographical distribution and that kind of thing. The way we do this, you know, look at where we are and where our, where our audience is. That would, you know, in 1994, five, when I did this and I was, you know, user participation and workshops, you know what that meant? Getting into my car, going to the office of my client, get people in the back, going to another office, be in a meeting room, that kind of, so it helped. And that's, that saves a lot of delay, right? So that's one. But also on the side of, for example, uh, data analysis, uh, a funny uh, story that I have from one of our clients of the, of the Humanity Group was that uh, we were, you know, so many people, so many organizations, they have an application and it's old monolithic structure and they want to bring it into a new situation and they want to rebuild it exactly as it is. And they will, which is bullshit, sorry for my language, it's not, which is not a good idea. Um, and... Uh, what, what happened is that they were claiming that specific functionalities were so, so, so important. And simple data analysis, you know, the digital data analysis under it showed that what they were asking, they thought this was used in 98% of the cases and it was used only in 0.4% of the cases because it was so complex. People found the work around in the solution to get in there as an end user, right? And this was only be because the people from the clients, no, no, no. And then the big data showed it. This is how, this is how your client people, that your visitors enter your website. This kind of simple data thing, this is what technology helps. And funny as it seems, when the technology tells it to you, except for Donald Trump, but people believe technology, right? So um, uh, there's, there's some myth mystical thing about technology. Technology only does what human beings makes it do, right? So it's us what we yep. put in and that's what we get out. Point is, very often we forgot what we can get out of the technology and then all of a sudden it can show and that's awesome. Uh, but the, the, the emerging technology, um, it will only change the pace of innovation, will only go up, never go down. And it helps the way we right. work, period. We need it. Right, right, thanks. So the technology will help us to uh, uh, get rid of the, the noises and the things and let us focus on the business and focus on the practices. Like you say, um, the agile and devil practice are, you know, many uh, can be uh, easily adopted in like flat organizations, but in some highly regulated industries like finance and banking, and sometimes they have uh, special rules, restrictions, and how for those people from those industries overcome those challenges, especially for the, from their uh, regulations. And like some, maybe in some industries, uh, development and ops have to be separated and those kind of rules. And do you have some experience and stories to share on that, um, Patrick, uh, maybe from you? Yeah, I think I see, I've seen a few approaches. Um, quite often when you say we're a company that is in a regulated industry, uh, they talk about the whole company and uh, when you drill time, which part is actually regulated, it is a, you know, it can be pinned down to a specific part that needs to be very much governated. So that's one area that where I see those companies deal with it is that they kind of like make sure that the part that is really strictly uh, confined is like not separated from the business, but it's, it's kind of like modeled differently from all the other parts. Um, the other part that I've seen is that quite often the automation um, and the whole kind of pipeline actually helps the regulated industry. And why? Because it creates traces of what is happening. And so an audit by somebody in a, 
in an automated environment is a lot easier. They can have access to a current inventory. They can have access to all the actions that have been done by who, on what time. The users have been managed uh, automatically. So there's an audit report from that. So, so those kind of industries, even though it seems like counterintuitive, they actually benefit from, from a lot of these uh, parts uh, there as well. So I don't know if that resonates with what you've been seeing, Ara. Ari, you want to jump in? Yeah, um, I'm one of those guys over 50 with gray hair and a beard. So let me go back in time a bit. And it's 1998, before writing the Azure Manifesto. And I'm working in this way. And it was not exactly the way, that, the way I work at the moment, but you know, similar, right? Uh, 1998, I was doing it for four years at that time. And I had, uh, we have a, an organization in the Netherlands totally focusing on quality and testing, a consultancy firm. And one of the guys from that firm was in the team. And this is a business bank in the South. And this guy went mm -hmm. berserk because this way of working in the bank and it's ridiculous and you will be bankrupt in a year and a blah, 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 blah. First of all, a couple of years later, his company totally switched to Agile and Agile certifications for testing, whatever the value is. So as long as it sells, right, we, do, we say other stuff. And the second part is we know that the fintech industry is moving into Agile. And highly regulated is not important because you have no other option than to change. Because if you look at banks, where I live is a little village, 17,000 people. 10 years ago, we had six different bank offices here. Now we have one very tiny bank office where one person is sitting. All the other banks are gone, right? Business models change. And it's not, can we do it or not? The only question is, how can we do it? And when I get back to what Patrick just said, you know, you have this process from A to B because we did it in the pharmacy. We did it in the aviation. We did it in the banking, in insurance, in the government. This is the process. And here you start and here you end. And it might be, that there here are regulations that you need to fulfill. And the only thing that you need to do is you have to take them into your process and just, just blend that into agile working. But people say no before they even did try it. And you see organizations getting killed, you know, in this kind of situations. In the finance is leading in agile transformations and DevOps, by the way, as well. Why? Because that business model is changing every single time. Telcos, they have to. It's not, it's not an option. It's do or die, right? The question is never, is it possible? The answer is always yes. And you know why it is possible? Because it's people that make it happen. Very right. simple. Find the solution. Now, instead of having an excuse. Right, right. Thanks uh, for that. Um, I see, uh, well, otherwise, it's about surviving of the company. You, either you are your survive or you are out. Uh, you will be uh, out of industry after a few years. Um, I see a lot of a business has been disrupted by somebody totally not from your industry. Uh, like we see a lot of internet companies are also uh, going to finance industries. So for the banks, for the uh, for the telcos, telecommunication companies, they need to find their ways uh, to be competitive. Um, if you are always protecting or by the rules or regulations, then it's an excuse for you to uh, out of the business someday. So I fully agree on that. Um, all right, we have been uh, discussed a lot. And there's a one, and we also receive a lot of uh, questions um, from different community, not only the DevOps community, but also other, other communities in China. There are some other communities, some other communities. And there is a question about um, the relationships between an agile and practice uh, and, Dev, and DevOps practices. Um, because from the time wise, we know uh, that Agile has been, Agile Manifesto has been like 10 years earlier or 11 years earlier than the DevOps. And the question is that how, uh, Patrick, maybe it's for you also, uh, how do you see the practice like Agile and Lean contribute um, the concept and the practice of DevOps? Um, do you see it is, a, they are interacted, interconnect with each other? Uh, and their question is that do you see uh, is Agile a part of DevOps or DevOps part of Agile? How can they uh, coexist? Are they complementary or are they conflict to each other? Start with you, Patrick. Thanks. 
I'm glad you asked the question because I, I it's like one of those internet myths that I want to like put to rest. I want to say like agile equals DevOps. It's that simple. There's like no difference in like conceptual kind of the the, the spirit, in my opinion. Uh, it, it is just a matter of like evolving practices, but mm -hmm. in, in essence, it's the same. So there is no conflict. There is no tension. Um, I, in my opinion, uh, you know, others might think differently, but I, I think we're trying to achieve the, the same thing. The, the, the difference was, is that uh, we're just in DevOps uh, kind of emerged an area that needed love in the agile kind of practices, like, you know, get closer to production, get the feedback from production. Uh, but again, there's nothing in, in my opinion, from the original agile thinking that was blogging it. It was more of a people didn't go as far as, as they could and, and were stretched uh, by new technology, by the cloud or kind of, you know, getting in up to that speed uh, that required like new practices. So no contradiction. I, I think we're, in my opinion, we're, uh, we, we, we're doing a lot of similarities, whether that's you doing TDD or the ops are doing monitoring. Uh, we're trying to do small deploys. You're doing like small code changes. Uh, so all kind of these practices, uh, like the Kanban flow was maybe more natural for people in production because it is very short, uh, like less kind of uh, uh, weekly cadence or two weekly cadence because it was continuous, a flow of things happening in production. Uh, so uh, no contrast there on there. I do want to mention, like I mentioned in the beginning, is that I do think... I want to get the communities closer back together. And especially because I think um, was that uh, the frameworks like, you know, you can shutter all you want about safe or bossa nova or different ways of organizational thinking. I, I think we really need to connect back uh, uh, as a DevOps community to those practices instead of becoming a siloed community that kind of doesn't learn from the ideas happening in the agile community, uh, how they're trying to change the, the business uh, side or uh, whether that's lean budgeting or other uh, real options or many of those kind of ideas are still foreign to uh, people in the DevOps community. I'm, I'm lucky to be in both and trying to follow both, but I would like to see more cross-pollination of, of, of both of the IDs. Right, thanks uh, for confirming that, uh, Patrick. So basically uh, you are also said, um, yeah, Pat, uh, DevOps is human problems. I think both uh, Azure and DevOps are trying to uh, focus on the, the value created for the business. So in that way, in such way, they are uh, very uh, much in line. And also with your uh, encouragement, more the collaborations between DevOps and Agile communities. I think uh, with our community efforts in China, we try to more working with other existing Agile communities. And by the way, in the DevOps days, we also have a lot of uh, uh, speakers from other uh, like Agile and Lean communities as well. Um, and same question for you, um, Ari, because you are um, one of the uh, author for Agile Manifestos. What is your view? And maybe you know other authors' view of Agile Manifestos see uh, the evolving and the emerging of DevOps. How do, do, do they see a part of each other and how do they, uh, how do you see the relationship between Agile and DevOps practices? Yeah, I, I will not speak for others. That's up to them, right? Um, right. But if, I, if you ask me how I see uh, Agile and DevOps, it's like yin and yang. I mean, one cannot do without the other. And like Patrick just said, if you make a DevOps department, then you didn't understand it at all. Right, uh, in my opinion, uh, you need to have the, the thorough expertise and the knowledge and to keep the innovation spirit. Uh, but for me, DevOps is something, if you really want to do agile in a proper way in the world of technology where we live, you know, you need to have your DevOps practices in place. I know when you go into transformation, it's not something that you have overnight. 
But this is this is the objective where you need to go. You know, you're sailing the ocean. You want to get to the other side of the ocean. You know where to go. And along the way, you will find all those storms and winds and maybe not the wind for a while. So you might, you know, do different things than you originally thought to get there. But they are together in the world where we live in today. You cannot do one without the other. It's really like yin and yang, in my opinion, meaning both right. positive, by the way. Yeah. Right, right. I think, Ari, by having you as our keynote speaker in DevOps Days, you already showed by actions, right? Collaboration between the two communities. And you are both other thought leaders. I think in the, in the future, there will be more events that we have a lot of DevOps um, people as speakers, agile events, and the other way around, like people like you, Ari, as author of Manifesto, you will be also happy to come back to many other DevOps Days events, right? Uh, next question is regarding the, um, you see, uh, we are having like two pizza rules, you know, and we, we see a lot of uh, people say Agile and DevOps are more easy to fit for small teams, but there are challenge for large scales uh, for organization levels. And how do you see um, organization can overcome uh, the Agile and DevOps practice in large scales? Um, you know, that's, you know, that's, that's how do you see it? Ari, maybe start with you this time. Yeah, um, of course, if you want to do Agile in just a team of six people versus a company of 600, you know, bigger mm -hmm. brings complexity. And that's as simple as that, right? So, and the, 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 the big point is in this, in this uh, uh, way of working, um, you have to do it together, you know, to get the success. But the misperception of people, the myth that you can only do with the small teams is bollocks because... Um, when I started doing this in the mid nineties, uh, in the beginning, I always had teams like 25, 30 people maybe. And, and uh, my largest team that I worked with on what we call the project at the time was close to 100 people. Um, that's not an organization, it's not a, a company, I know, but it's not just that small team because you know there, there are jobs that go beyond with just one team. And if you do, um, you know, like, like full delivery, uh, if I was with clients putting a new product, right? In, in the market, then you need to have your marketing in place. Legal has to has done the job. Uh, there need to be, in this case, it was audit, uh, was in, in the, uh, um, connected to it. We had the data conversion. We had six teams working in parallel. It's all done. It's been there, right? And the fact that it's maybe more complicated and maybe more difficult, or maybe it even is for sure, that doesn't mean that you don't have to do it. But what people tend to say is, oh, that's impossible before even doing it. Or they bump into one problem and say, oh, and see, it doesn't work. And that's what you have to get over it. And this is the old old school thinking. It's not something that you try. And you have to get agile is not a purpose. DevOps is not a purpose. It's okay, we have an organization, and I'm not talking profit organizations only. It's also, you know, where I live, governmental organizations, look at where we are in the COVID crisis. Okay, things are changing faster than ever. How as an organization can can we can we make sure that we are able to follow the changes and respond to that change with a high level of quality, whether I'm a company making money, whether I'm an organization serving the public. And the question is not, can we? No, the question is how? And that's what I miss very often, you know, and we all know when you're on stage or when you're in front of a group, you know, those people that sit in front of you and they listen to criticize, you know, you're halfway your first sentence, they will say it's not true. And, and where we need to go together and what really make the difference is listen to understand. So you had your best practice, man. Tell me, learn me, because if it works for you, maybe it will work for me. Can I find a corner in this organization where I can try it? If, if, I'm, if I don't feel secure, can I try it? And then start expanding from there instead of putting it out on the whole organization and then expecting it to be perfect overnight. That's, that's where we need to go. Large organizations can be done. It's not easy, right? It's not easy. And this is why I said in the beginning, a lot of organizations still struggle with the basics. but. You have to do it. That's the point. So, Ari, there's a, you see there's a, like a lot of uh, uh, frameworks, models like uh, uh, SAFE or LESS or Spotify models to helping organizations uh, implementing Agile and DevOps in large scale. Do you see those methods will helping those organizations overcome the scaling problems and new challenges? I think in general, they do help to overcome. The problem is what I just referred to. You know, I like a phrase from Winston Churchill. 
Uh, Churchill said at one moment, uh, perfection is not a state. Perfection is an ambition. You know, to reach mm -hmm. your ambition, you need to change a lot. So perfect people change a lot. But what we do is in the past, the way we work was totally prescribed. This is how we work. And now we expect, again, totally pre-described something that tells us how to work. And then we get a manual. And my God, we are so happy because we have a manual that tells us what to do. Instead of getting, and now we're back to the beginning of the interview, right? Instead of getting back, okay, what is the mindset below all this? Why are we doing this? How can we make it work? And then taking the practices from the methodologies that help you most. That's where you need to go. Right. All right. Thanks. Uh, Patrick, what's your say uh, regarding the, the sizing and scaling? <clears throat> yeah, I think a lot of the frameworks and, and practices are focused on making things visible for people outside of their own group and nurturing communication. Um, I don't think that this is the actual end goal. The actual end goal is that... Um, you can kind of rely and trust the other groups to do the right thing. Uh, but before you, you got to uh, understand what they were asking for, you got to understand what they need. Uh, and, and this building up of trust, um, I think the best way to describe it is that when I, I ask somebody, what is your hiring strategy? I hire somebody who can take away part of my problems. And if you trust the person that can take away part of your problems, uh, that means you're trusting them to, to deal with something. You don't have to focus on that. But building that trust is you, both done by leveling them up on education. Sometimes they need education. It's just not a matter of how well they're doing. So, you know, educate your people, making sure they are reliable uh, in in a way that you know you you get your uh, your practices going, they show up and so on. Uh, but the, the hardest part is that making them care. Like, why should they care about your problems? Why should they care about the business? And and kind of dealing with that is the hard part of scaling something in an organization. Obviously, you know consensus and and, and making sure everybody's on the same page, but. If everybody's caring about the same things and, and they're aligned on the same goals, uh, that really helps. But part of the trust is the double-edged sword between we want to give the self-organizing teams everything they can decide themselves versus a global central strategy that is feels they have to be steering, uh, which creates a conflict. Like on the one hand, you don't trust them. <laughs> you just want them to report to you all the time. You can do whatever you want, but you need to report and I can steer. So that, that kind of creation of trust is really hard. Uh, but working on building that trust is what makes it scale in an organization. And sometimes it's the one person relationship between one team and the other, one person in the management team and the other, but building those interpersonal kind of relationships of trust uh, where you rely on somebody else, you don't have to do it yourself, that frees you from the cost. Like meetings are very costly. Report meetings are very costly. Uh, so turning it around, like right. whatever you do is building trust uh, in many different ways is, is kind of the way how this scales. Right, thanks both. So to summarize the answers to implementing Agile and Demo practice, you also need to have a right mindset, but also uh, the way how you manage your people, if you are micromanagement people and the way you're reporting, uh, the trust and the mindset are very important because that's also uh, cost a lot of time and the self, you know, the self-management team uh, require a lot of trust and that also will help organization implementing uh, those practices in the large scales. And before I let you go, I will also pick a, a one or two questions from the audience now with us. I think this uh, question is more maybe for, um, for Patrick. I will read it through. Huh? Um, the question here is that actually, even we have already built CI CD to make code deploy to the production automatically, but in a big group, 
with many applications integrated with each other to support the business. It's questioned that whether we should follow I2 practice process to make production operation. How do you think? Um, from the early days, uh, people in the DevOps community uh, have thought about um, DevOps being incompatible with Agile. Uh, sorry, incompatible with ITIL. Uh, right. and, and we already talked about that. Like, uh, people have been discussing whether Agile and DevOps have been incompatible, yes or no. I believe, right. I, and I've read the seven books, uh, there is nothing in spirit against uh, the ITIL practices helping DevOps uh, uh, people. Um, they have written down a more formal process, uh, but I do think you need to reread it with a more uh, open mind in a way that, let's say you have a change advisory board. You could say like every change needs to have like approvals. If you can free up the time of your change advisory board by having a lot of standard requests and the standard requests have been automated and the standard requests become self-servicing for others to do that same job, you don't need to treat those parts in your change advisory board anymore because they're standard and don't uh, take up time where the change advisory board should be discussing the hard impact. The change advisory board, taking that as an example again, is a good test to see how much friction something has to change in your organization. So if you have a lot of heated debate uh, in your change advisory board, you probably see uh, this come up in, in, your, uh, in that part. Reliability, maintainability, all the illities that ITIL subscribes are equally important uh, on DevOps. So yes, you need to have your uh, catalog of services, but now thanks to the new practices, we can have that more up-to-date. So who can be against that? So it is not one excluding the other uh, as such, but you might, you know, given that uh, the books have been uh, written quite some time ago, you might have to rethink that. But it's very similar to reread the Agile Manifesto uh, and, and kind of uh, think in the same spirit. Um, uh, that's what I would advise people. So it's not something against it, but look at it with a fresh set of technology, fresh set of practices, and translate the mentality, not per se what has been predominantly the practices uh, uh, in the ITIL. Uh, so, uh, for many years now, so. And I hear they're right. working on a new version of it as well, right? Son, you, you're probably right. familiar with that. Uh, and that will really uh, make it more actual uh, in a good way. Right. Um, thanks, uh, Patrick, for that. So I know that you also, you mentioned yourself, you will read all seven ITO books. I know even, I think 10 years, 15 years ago, you yourself also has been ITO certified with Exxon. So um, that means that you know how DevOps and, and, and Agile, uh, Agile product, uh, process can be comfortable with each other. Still, you see in ITO, we're talking about configuration, release management, which, you know, it happens also a lot in DevOps practices. You're talking about the standard reporting of advisor report, and you're encouraging people uh, to re, uh, read the, the, the books again with ITO, but with open mind, with back, back uh, on the mind that of all the Agile and DevOps practice, and that maybe will create, create, help you to create the links. Um, I think for the time, uh, once again, I don't see uh, more questions uh, coming up. Um, uh, I would like to, once again, thank you both for your, for your time, for your supporting for DevOps Days community. I know there's still a lot of uh, questions, things that we can talk, um, but I'm, I'm hoping that we can, uh, having you back in the near future, either in, in this uh, remote way or physically in one of the events. Uh, thanks again for your support. Thank you. Thank, thank your you, son, for the invitation, and I wish everybody a very nice evening, wherever you are. Thanks, Ari. Thanks, Patrick. Have a nice evening, too, for you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.